And by that, we mean introduce yourself in the chat, please. It would be wonderful to know your name, what your Yale affiliation is, where you're Zooming in from, what made you interested in today's topic? Uh, you know, I think we're all very interested in, in this topic. It's incredibly timely and something that is on the news every day and sort of taken hold of our lives. And I, I for one, am really eager to uh, boost my education on the subject. So um, I'm glad that you guys felt the same way and really delighted to see all of you here. I think we're going to have a really good conversation with Professor Mary Habeck. And Mary, you can feel free to take a look at the chat. Lots of introductions coming in. Um, hi to Suzanne from Hopkinton, Massachusetts, who says, my gran grandfather came to Boston via Edmonton, Canada. Family from, I'm not going to be able to pronounce this, Suzanne, the Tamir in the early 1900s. Uh, Jonathan Edwards, class of 1981. All right, welcome. Hi to Adrian in LA. And Yurim, class of 2003, poli sci and history major. Hi to Dan in Northern New Jersey. And Telia, I think that's right, Telia, Jackson School Board in Newport Beach, California. Nice to see you. Hi to Barbara, class of 79 from Belmont, Massachusetts. Lots of you from Massachusetts tuning in today. That's really wonderful. I always like to see who is zooming in from the furthest away. Hi to Kim, class of 49, Jonathan Edwards in New Haven. And Cynthia, class of 89 in New York City. I also love to see all the different uh, generations of classes that turn up. Um, so we've got a 2003 poli sci major and a 1949 uh, graduate. Is that right? Or is that a typo? Ken. Um, all right. Hi to Tim Branford, class of 70 in Kenosha, Wisconsin. And oh my goodness, the introductions are coming in. Hi to Rebecca in Frankfurt, Germany. It'd be interesting, some of you who are overseas, um, to share, you know, how the news reports are where you are. Hi to Danielle, uh, Daniel, grandfather from Roots. Oh gosh, I've definitely got to brush up on my Ukrainian pronunciation. Uh, but grandfather from southwest of Kiev and grandmother from Moldova. Very nice to have you with us. And I think our numbers are pretty steady, rising little by little. Please keep the introductions coming in because I know Professor Haybeck is enjoying seeing who's here and we'll have a chance to um, to read any of the introductions that we missed after the session is over. Uh, hi to Olivia from Brooklyn, who says, I wish all the people who don't know they should be interested would tune in anyway. Well, the good news, Olivia, is that this is being recorded and it's being live uh, streamed on Zoom for those who couldn't get in. We did have about a thousand people register today. Um, so one of the most popular uh, presentations that we've done. So I think a lot of people are interested for those who can't make it today or who have to log off early. The recording will be available on the Alumni Academy and Alumni College website. All right, I'm going to get started. Um, I'm Lauren Summers. I am Senior Director of Lifelong Learning and Travel at the Yale Alumni Association. This presentation is being brought to you um, by two programs that are part of the department that I lead. Uh, the Yale Alumni College program offers uh, courses in cities around the US, small seminars in person, building great community amongst alumni. Uh, most of the Yale Alumni College courses are taught by alumni themselves, alumni like Professor Mary Haybeck who may be faculty at other universities or um, experts in the fields that they offer. And since the pandemic began, the Yale Alumni College courses have all been online, which is wonderful because so many of you from all over the world now have access to take them. And Yale Alumni Academy brings you the faculty scholarship and uh, research expertise of Yale University. So specifically focusing on the expertise of Yale faculty and gives you a bridge to stay connected to the university throughout your life with sessions like this one, 
as well as online learning experiences and on-campus learning experiences. So I invite you to check out our websites, Yale Alumni College and Yale Alumni Academy to learn more about these two offerings from the Alumni Association. Um, I am going to move to our introduction of our special guest, Mary Habeck. And Mary is with us today as our, our featured speaker and honored guest and is offering a course on this topic of um, the history of relations between Russia and Ukraine for Yale Alumni College this semester. Unfortunately, her course is completely sold out. She's a very popular instructor. And that was one of the reasons why we wanted to make this session available to you today to give all of you some time with Mary um, in case you were not able to sign up for her course. Uh, Professor Habeck is a strategic planner and expert on military affairs, Russia and extremism. She teaches on these issues at Johns Hopkins School of Advanced International Studies, Georgetown and American University, while also running her consulting firm, Applied Brand Strategy. She is a senior fellow with the Foreign Policy Research Institute. From 2005 to 2013, she was an associate professor in strategic studies at uh, the Johns Hopkins School of Advanced International Studies. And she taught courses on extremism, military history, and strategic thought. Before that, uh, she taught at uh, American and European military history in Yale's history department from 1994 to 2005. She received her PhD in history from Yale in 1996, uh, her master's in international relations from Yale in 1989, and her BA in international studies, Russian and Spanish from Ohio State in 1987. She was appointed by President Bush to the Council on the Humanities at the National Endowment for the Humanities from 2006 to 2013. And from 2008 to 2009, she was the Special Advisor for Strategic Planning on the National Security Council staff, where she worked on extremism. So as you can see, we are really, really lucky to have time with Professor Habeck today. Thank you so much for doing this presentation and welcome, Professor Habeck. Uh, thanks a lot. I'm happy to be here. All right. Well, I think uh, all of us are really eager to hear from you. So I will turn it over to you to, to start your presentation. Fantastic. Thank you for that kind introduction. I'm going to have a PowerPoint slide for us to um, look at while I'm uh, doing my presentation. But um, the only reason I do PowerPoint slides is in order to add to what I'm going to say. I'm not planning on just reading along um, with what I have uh, in front of us. And all of us are really concerned about the events unfolding right now in the Ukraine and wondering if this has broader implications, um, not just for Russia, but beyond Russia for actions by a lot of actors who are watching what is happening in the Ukraine and perhaps making decisions about what they're going to do. In fact, I'm going to give you guys um, my preliminary framing for this challenge. It's something I've been thinking about a lot, actually since about 2014, when Russia made uh, the decision to invade the Crimea and part of Eastern Ukraine. I began to think about this in terms of um, a kind of um, bigger problem than just one about Russia. In fact, the way I started to think about it was status quo versus non-status quo or revisionist powers. So what do I mean by that? Well, status quo powers are those who are basically satisfied with the way the world is. They think that they have achieved what their countries um, can achieve, should achieve in the world. And they're basically satisfied with the international system and want things to remain the same uh, the way that they are. Um, so, and you could put Britain, the United States, Canada, a lot of countries into the category of status quo powers and groups of countries or international institutions like the EU, the UN or NATO, absolutely um, like the international system, the international legal environment, for instance, 
um, the way that we interact with each other on the international stage, they're very happy with the way things are. On the other hand, there are revisionist powers, sometimes called anti-status quo powers, that are not satisfied with the way things are for one reason or another, either because they have um, personal kinds of concerns for their country, or they think that the international system as a whole does not serve everyone well. So it can be just, um, I wish that my country had more power. I wish that our values were the ones that people shared, or it can be about how the international system as a whole should be organized. Revisionist powers today would include China, Russia, Iran, North Korea, Pakistan, Turkey, and Venezuela. This is not a comprehensive list. There are other countries that for one reason or another, sometimes for minor issues, sometimes for more major reasons, are concerned about their place in the international system or about the international system as a whole. So for instance, Afghanistan, absolutely, with the takeover by the Taliban would be included as a revisionist power. But there are also non-aligned nations, that is nations that kind of like the status quo, but are listening to the arguments that are made by various revisionist powers. And they're trying to make up their mind, which one of these groups should I belong to? Which one of them is best for my country? Which meets the national security interests, for instance, or the economic interests of my country? And there are an awful lot of countries that fit into this category as well. Uh, for instance, India recently has kind of moved itself into this non-aligned position, but most of the Middle East, Latin America, and Africa probably fit into this category of kind of I support things, but I'm open to an argument one way or another uh, by those revisionist powers. Now, the reason I'm framing things this way is because um, throughout history, there have been points in time when status quo powers have been firmly in charge and have been able to sort of set the conditions for how the international system works. And they haven't really been challenged all that much by revisionist powers. On the other hand, there have been certain points in time when revisionist powers have been stronger than status quo powers. And almost always when this occurs, you not only have more violence and more tendency to have warfare, but you also might have a situation where the in entire international system is upended. And there have been um, various points throughout the 20th century when that has in fact occurred. Obviously, World War I and World War, War II are the big examples of periods when the status quo powers have been rather weak or divided, and the anti-status quo powers have not only managed to carry out a massive amount of violence and seize territory and cause a lot of bloodshed, but they have also managed to uh, push major revisions in how the entire international system works. It's my contention that what is happening right now in the Ukraine may signal one of those periods in history. And I've been watching really carefully to see the responses by status quo powers or institutions in order to see if they're strong enough to support our current international system and the way it is currently organized, or if these revisionist powers are able to push far enough that they cause a serious change in how we are organized as a planet. So what I'm going to talk about today is not just about Ukraine, but more than that, where this fits perhaps in a broader way of understanding our international system and whether it's strong enough to deal with the challenges that are confronting it. But in order to do that, I'm going to start by looking just at Ukraine and Russia, the origins of this particular challenge to the system, and then the course of the conflict. And finally, 
in the very th uh, last third section, we'll take a look at outcomes, that is consequences, and if these might have the kinds of serious um, changes or revisions to the international system that other sorts of periods in time have seen, and especially those periods before World War I um, and World War II. So the origins of this conflict, please forgive me for this rather graphic picture, but I think it's necessary in order to illustrate the point that this does not just come from a place of a war of choice for either one of these nations. In fact, this war is seen by both of these countries as being existential challenges. And the reason for that is in a lot of ways, the um, illustrated by this picture, which is children suffering during the um, terrible genocide, uh, genocidal famine that the Soviet Union put Ukraine through in the 1930s the so-called Holodomor, as uh, Ukrainians call it, uh, Golodomor, as Russians would call it. It is a terrible period in Ukrainian history, but it also is a period that Russians, uh, the Russian government today refuses to acknowledge or to say that there was anything wrong about it. And this is one of the reasons why Ukrainians believe that what is occurring right now is not just um, incursions or an attempt to change their government by force, but rather an existential threat to them as a people. So this has deep roots because Ukraine as a concept has been understood one way by Russian speaking people and a completely different way by Ukrainian speaking people. So as a concept, it kind of grew out of something that is usually called in English Kievan Rus or um, the Rus who were a, um, an empire, a kingdom that existed for hundreds of years that was well respected on the international scene, had um, trading relationships on an international basis, was sort of a, a central clearinghouse um, during um, a critical period of European and Asian history. And it was self-confident and growing. If you take a look at its uh, sort of spread and extension over time, it was a country that understood its place in the world. And that was one amongst equals. And the equals for it were things like the Byzantine Empire um, or the um, Abbasid Caliphate. It was proud to take its place as a great power um, for several hundred years. But in 1240, the Mongols or Tatars uh, came through Kievan Rus as they did a lot of other places, like for instance, the Abbasid Caliphate and destroyed it, uh, conquered it turned it into a vassal or tributary nation, one that paid uh, um, a humiliating tribute every year to show their submission to the Mongol horde. And um, while you were allowed to practice your religious beliefs, there was also persecution that occurred during this period. And a lot of people um, knew that they were no longer a great power, that they, were taking their place as just um, somebody who had to submit to the will of others. And after this, it did not regain its um, unitary existence, but instead part of it was able to turn into the Muscovy Principality and eventually win its independence from uh, the Tatars or the Mongols. But other parts, and that includes those that we today call Ukraine, uh, were not able to regain their independence and instead found themselves conquered and occupied by stronger neighbors. And this includes Lithuania, Poland, and um, at times um, the Ottoman Empire. This kind of existence turned it from a great power into what I call a space between, an area that was 
contested for by and through other nations and empires. And they ran across it, divided it up, um, included it as part of their country, and then it would be taken away by one of their stronger neighbors. It really didn't have a separate existence, this space between. In some ways, it reminds me of Afghanistan, which also found itself invaded, run across um, by the count of one scholar a thousand times in recorded history. In this case, a few less times for uh, Ukrainians, but it was still a kind of marginal existence. And then they were uh, conquered, the area, the territory uh, that had been the center of Kievan Rus by Moscow, by uh, Russia and the Russian Empire. And the Tsars then ruled over this territory, calling it not Ukraine, not any of the names that had been used for it in the past, but rather they called it Novaya Rasiya. That is, it was just an appendage of Russia, new Russia, rather than having its own separate existence. And that's basically what it was until um, the late 19th century, when Ukrainian nationalism began to assert and argue that they deserve to be treated as an equal with others and to be recognized as a nationality on par with the Russians. Ukrainian nationalism then was a powerful force, just as it was in a lot of other countries in the 19th and early 20th century, but for the most part, it did not find an outlet in an independent country. And in fact, the strongest nationalism, Ukrainian nationalism, was in Lviv, or the part of Ukraine that was still occupied by, uh, by Austria-Hungary. How did Russians view Ukraine and Ukrainians then during this time period, and frankly, later as well? Well, one of the names they called it, besides Novaya Rasiya, um, that name kind of went away after a while, was as Malo Rasiya, that is, as Little Russia. And the Little Russians were the name that they gave to Ukrainians. And this term expresses, I think, pretty well their feelings about Ukrainians, that they were kind of lesser. They weren't quite as good as other Russians. They viewed them as peasants, you know, out there in the countryside working, illiterate, coarse, um, not really uh, civilized would have been the way that they talked about them in the 19th century and before. And they also had another side to them, Cossacks, these sort of free ranging bands that carried out all kinds of depredations before they were tamed, as they would have put it, by the czarist regime and used for their own purposes. There was in fact a kind of fear of Ukrainians as well. They weren't just lesser, they had a wild side to them that had to be kept in check. And their language, well, the so-called, as they put it, Ukrainian language that was touted by these new Ukrainian nationalists, they denigrated it. It really wasn't separate from Russian. In fact, they said, Ukrainians are Russians. They just speak Russian very badly. They have terrible pronunciation. They, they're so illiterate. They don't even know how to speak a language properly is how they put it. And in fact, they suppressed the teaching and speaking of Ukrainian. There were no schools that taught in the Ukrainian language in the Tsarist empire. So bottom line, Ukraine is Russia. It's part of us, it's nothing else. It can be nothing else. These peasants who speak a, their own language, so poorly and call it a separate language. Ukraine is Russia. And then along came the Bolshevik Revolution and the Holodomor. And during this terrible time, things began to change. 
because at first Ukrainians were encouraged. The revolution promised equality, promised that Ukrainian would be recognized, promised that there would be a lot of autonomy for Ukrainians in their own country and gave shape to a Ukraine that you could call your own. But it came at a terrible price. There was a civil war. There was a massive amount of bloodshed, bloodletting across Ukraine because a lot of Ukrainians wanted their independence and didn't want to be part of this concept of a Soviet Russia or a Soviet Union, as it was later called. Even if it came with the promise of autonomy, it didn't come with the promise of independence and they wanted independence. And so there was civil war in Ukraine. And when it ended, um, a lot of hopes for an independent Ukraine also were dashed. However, Ukrainian was taught in schools at least until Stalin came along. And then he began to quash all of that, not just in Ukraine, but across the entire Soviet Union. There was going to be no autonomy, no independence for any of the other uh, so-called nationalities. And when he began the collectivization of agriculture in the early 1930s, it was Ukraine that was treated the worst of all of the different parts of this new Soviet Union. In fact, all of their food was taken away from them because, he said, they are wreckers. They are destroying our new Soviet Union by refusing to give up their food. And the quotas were put higher and higher, making it impossible for people to live and leading to the death of lots of Ukrainians. In fact, four to five million Ukrainians died. In comparison to their population, that's the equivalent of 40 to 50 million Americans dying purposely in a famine. This is why it's called genocide. So those are the facts. The fiction, on the other hand, that Russians at the time believed um, because this is what they were taught in their schools and the way Stalin put it was that this was just the fault of a certain small number of people. There had been no large numbers of people who died and there was just this rebelliousness in Ukraine that refused to allow people to accept that they should help others. These rich peasants, kulaks deserved what they got. That's the fiction. And that's what uh, Russians and others in the Soviet Union were taught until the 1980s. Because in 1980s, Glasnost under Gorbachev allowed Ukrainians and Russians for the first time to speak freely about what had actually happened in their countries. And the result was in 1989, that people began to understand that this had not been just kulaks who had died, not just a few people who were wreckers and wanted to destroy the Soviet Union, but rather that you had had a massive tragedy that had nearly wiped out an entire generation of Ukrainians. These discoveries turned the relationship between Ukraine and the Soviet Union, Ukraine, and later Russia into a conflictual one because Ukrainians understood this was the truth, whereas a lot of Russians refused to believe it and wouldn't talk about a holodomor or a golodomor. Instead, they believed it was all fiction. And they, of course, refused to apologize for it or to do anything to make up for it or even to admit there had been something wrong done. On the other hand, the Great Patriotic War was for Russia as well as Ukraine, a, an existential fight and for Russia would become deeply embedded. There was in fact this kind of sanctification of this war in Soviet writing and Soviet teaching and Soviet thinking about this time period that was deeply embedded in the Russian mind, in Russian culture, in Russian society, in Russian teaching in schools, that we suffered during this period and were nearly wiped out by the Nazis. 
only by coming together as a people were we able to fight off this external threat. And this sanctified the lives of all those who had died during this war. On the other hand, Ukraine had not acted the way that Russians or the Soviets at the time believed they should. They in fact took the opportunity of the Nazi invasion to attack the Soviet Union. And only after there were serious uh, threats to uh, Ukrainians, not Jewish people, but Ukrainian um, sort of as a, a separate nationality from those who are Jewish, were they willing to turn their guns on the Nazis? And in fact, a lot of people have pointed out that they cooperated with the Nazis in massacres against Jewish people during this time period. The result is that Russians understood Ukrainians as duplicitous, as willing to betray their own country for their own selfish ends. Whatever they were, they weren't worth it. And they have this deep mistrust that this kind of support for ultra-nationalists, for neo-Nazis will come back. So the deep roots of this problem explain why on both sides, they see what is happening today in this kind of reflection of the Holodomor that we can no longer trust you and the great patriotic war that is World War II that we can no longer trust you Ukrainians either. And if you look, however, at the suffering of the Ukrainian people during this time period, it's just one of many, many sorts of events that caused massive uh, bloodshed in uh, Ukraine. Um, this is a partial listing of those events that led to the death of hundreds of thousands, if not millions of people. The worst, of course, was World War II, 10.4 million, was over 30% of the population killed, many Jewish, but others as well. Once the fight was joined, they understood suddenly that this was not just about Jewish people, that Slavs as well were being treated as subhumans. And there were other crises, a great terror that had occurred just before this, a famine after the war, and what are called mortality crises, when the living, um, the um, lifespans of people across the former Soviet Union declined and people were dying by the droves in their 50s and early 60s from a lot of different things. But Ukrainians looking at this thought to themselves, if we hadn't been part of the Soviet Union, if we weren't tied so tightly to Tsarist Russia, perhaps we would have avoided these. And they began to think of these as the fault of Tsarist Russia, the fault of the Soviet Union, that is the fault of Russia today. But the Russian view, quite different. And these are views uh, directly from the Kremlin. In their look at what's going on between them and Ukraine, they don't blame Ukraine for um, the problems, the troubles, that Russia might have faced. Instead, they make a very different argument. They say, in fact, that Ukraine is an indelible part of Russia, that it's not a separate country at all. Ukraine means on the border. It's just Russians who happen to live on the borderlands of our country. This is Putin in April of 2008, first expressing this. But in 2014, he said the same thing. And again in 2020, in fact, he argued during that uh, discussion that Ukrainian national identity only emerged as a product of foreign intervention. And without foreigners, meddling in internal affairs of Russia, it never would have perceived itself even as being a separate country. 
And as one of his uh, main ideologues said, there is no Ukraine. It's a kind of mental disorder to even say that it exists. and kind of part of Russia that needs to be brought back into the Russian fold. And this kind of understanding of Ukraine explains why there have been nothing but problems between the two countries with Russia feeling perfectly free to meddle in the internal affairs of Ukraine anytime it wants. There have been a series of events that have occurred since 1991 that explain how we've gotten to where we are at today. This is a picture, by the way, of the Maidan Revolution in 2014, 2013, 2014. The first thing that happened, of course, was the collapse of the Soviet Union, which was understood by Russians as a calamity, but understood by Ukrainians as an opportunity. Immediately, Ukrainian independence was declared. And although you had terrible economic times throughout the 1990s, just as you did in Russia itself, there was this sort of pride that we were making it, that Ukrainians were creating a separate existence, a new country was being born. But Russians were heading down a completely different path. There were a series of nationalists who are arguing that, in fact, um, there should be a reunification of all of the different republics that had declared independence, been recognized by the international community as separate states. And in the case of Dugin and Surkov, both of them argued that the international system itself was to blame for all of these problems, that the international system had to be revised, that it was no longer serving the interests, not just of Russia, but a whole series of countries like China. And it specifically mentioned, Dugan and Surikov specifically mentioned countries like Iran as potential allies in this anti-status quo fight. On the other hand, Dantsov was a Ukrainian nationalist, ultra-nationalist who had made arguments about Ukrainian separatism and its need to become a separate state that resonated with some Ukrainians. And so in the 1990s, you have the two countries going opposite directions, animated by nationalism. In the case of the Ukrainians, generally a mild form of nationalism, but there were some who found the arguments of Dantsov, which was an ultra-nationalist vision, um, equally compelling. And this also is going to create problems between uh, the two nations. Putin himself during this time was making up his mind that there had to be a re-adjudication of the Cold War. He did not believe the Soviet Union had lost and he believed that the breakup of the Soviet Union was a disaster. Uh, that raspat, that collapse, was something that had to be undone. And in 1999, he began to work to undo that collapse. NATO expansion then was understood in this context with a lot of Russians understanding this as a threat and Ukrainians seeing it as an opportunity, but it also could be dangerous and for Americans who believe the Cold War was over and done with, that it was time to move on, that it was possible to take our peace dividend, get rid of our debt and cut our military and finally have a kind of normal, sane existence, it was seen as part of perhaps a new world order, a way of organizing ourselves that could reach out maybe to Russians even, and there were some attempts to do so. But others 
couldn't understand why NATO should even exist at all. And so there was a kind of back and forth in American policy during the 1990s that was understood as being part of a debate by Americans and as a threat by a lot of Russians. Then along came what were generally called the color revolutions. And the orange revolution in uh, uh, Ukraine was part of this. 2004, 2005, this was about asserting the independence of Ukraine from Russian dominance. And it was something that was utterly uh, against the vision that Putin and others had within Russia of reunification. This was understood not as an internal problem that Ukrainians need to work out, but rather a rejection of unification, of working with Russia, of having interests contrary to the national interests of Russia. And from this point on, we see Putin working in an ever more aggressive way in order to unify countries around um, the, uh, uh, the borders of Russia back into some form that will give Russia more control over their national security actions and their foreign policy. This is kind of the minimum desiderata that he had. The Maidan a uh, revolution also has to be understood in this context as well. Here as well, Ukrainians were asserting their right to have someone who did not have ties to uh, Russia that would be independent and allow a truly independent foreign policy and existence for Ukraine. This one was met not as the Orange Revolution was with kind of disinformation and underhanded kind of actions or political warfare, but rather with outright intervention. But a lot of this was possible because Ukraine was still divided as well. There was part of Ukraine that actually wanted this unification with Russia. In the far Eastern provinces, what people usually call Donbass, there were a lot of Russian speakers, a lot of people who were ethnically Russian as well, who believed that unification with Russia was the right way forward. And they were willing to work with Putin. But the vast majority of Ukrainians rejected this. It's something like 80% to 20% would be the kind of division that people usually talk about. So it's an overwhelming majority who reject that vision. They wanted a more European Ukraine. They wanted to become part of the European Union. This is what led to the Maidan revolution in the first place. So Russian desiderata at this point is they don't want to have partners. They don't want to have allies. They don't want to have countries that have an independence at all. Basically, Putin wants to have minions those who will do what he tells them to do or what Russia tells them to do without question. And that's what they have been attempting, he specifically, and those around him to implement around their border. And so he decided to invade Crimea and help to start to run to support uh, the Donbass conflict that is ongoing to this day a conflict that is blending now into this larger war uh, with Ukraine. The global response to this was, I shall just call it anemic. People recognized in some ways the de facto um, annexation of Crimea. You look at maps and they always have it colored differently from the rest of Ukraine, as if you're recognizing somehow that this is true, that this is part of Russia. And the, uh, the territories where you have this conflict ongoing, Donbass during this time period, there's a kind of, eh, I guess we have to live with the fact of Russian domination of these districts and provinces. And the uh, sanctions regime 
that was put in place had a lot of room for wiggle and a lot of room for Russia to find other uh, ways um, through and around it and support its economy. Well, at first, their economy did take a hit. It certainly wasn't Putin and his friends that suffered. And eventually, they were able to figure out ways around it through other non-status quo powers, other revisionist powers. And in fact, his relationship with these revisionist powers during this time period strengthened until there's basically little uh, daylight between the foreign policy of Russia and the foreign policy of, for instance, China. And I'm, we're going to come back to this point in just a bit. So then why this new war? Putin's justifications that NATO expansion threatens Russia or that um, it doesn't suit the national security interest of Russia. Well, this has been around for quite a while, this sort of argument, and it has not really made more sense than it did back in the 1990s. More than that, his argument that the Ukrainians who are currently in charge of the country are in fact neo-Nazis makes even less sense or that they're empowering neo-Nazis. Sure, there are supporters of Dantsov and there are actual neo-Nazis in Ukraine as there are in a lot of other countries, but they have not been empowered by Zelensky nor is there any sign that he is putting them into positions of authority to implement their, their concepts or their ideas. So you might be thinking, this really doesn't seem to be anything more than him just justifying whatever he wants to do. But in fact, I believe that because of the trauma of the Great Patriotic War, because of the Russian view of how Ukrainians acted during that war, that there are in fact real existential fears from Russians. However justified by the facts they are, I believe that they feel this existential threat. And behind it is something else. This concept of Eurasianism that's supported by Surkov and by uh, Dugan and others, a vision that Kiev is absolutely vital for the safety and security of Moscow. And not just Kiev, but also Kazakhstan. Without Kazakhstan, you don't have security. This is the argument that is made by Dugan. And I think it explains not just the invasion of Ukraine, but also the decision to go into Kazakhstan that we'll discuss in just a bit here. Because there's been a series of pre-war maneuvers that say a lot about Russia, Ukraine, and other revisionist powers, China in particular. So in April of 2021, this is when Russia actually began its buildup towards war. They had at least 80,000 troops in place by the end of the month. And while they said it was just maneuvers and war games, those troops never went away. In August of 2021, Russia emphasized the disgrace and failure of what was publicly called a pathetic America, a pathetic set of leaders as Afghanistan fell to the Taliban. And they were joined by their partners, the Chinese, on 16th of August, the Chinese Communist Party put out an official communique in which they said the Afghan war shows not if, but once war breaks out in the straits, Taiwan's defense will collapse in hours and the US military won't come to help. You, um, Afghanistan and the events around the collapse of the American engagement in Afghanistan affected both of these revisionist powers very, very deeply. On the 27th of August of October, excuse me, 2021, 
then you have a meeting between Russia, China, Iran, and Pakistan in Tehran. This meeting was supposedly a continuation of meetings that had been going on about Afghanistan before this, but of course, Afghanistan has now fallen. And these are the revisionist powers. Four um, of, or sorry, three of these four have territorial desiderata around the world and have been making maneuvers, making comments, statements that suggest that they're preparing to do something about those desiderata, whether it's Kashmir or Ukraine or Taiwan. Three of these four have been talking about taking territory. And Iran has been talking about nuclear weapons, which is something all four of these share as well. 6 of January, 2022, Russia invaded Kazakhstan to put down an uprising. It was quick, it was easy, over in a week. They took care of the rioters, so-called protesters or demonstrators, other people might call them, and quashed any sort of public uh, expression of dissatisfaction with the leader of Kazakhstan who had a very close, tight relationship with Putin and Moscow. A lot of people ignored this sign that Russia was preparing to use force in order to prevent anyone from moving away from their control. And in February of 2022, we have a massive buildup. It goes from 100,000 to 190,000 Russian troops on the border with Ukraine. All kinds of noise made about why we're doing this. Don't nobody interfere with what we're doing here. This is an internal problem. Uh, the same kind of thing that was said about Kazakhstan. And the 4th of February, something else happened. There was a joint statement put out by Russia and China, a public statement that affirmed that Taiwan, as uh, the statement said, was an inalienable part of China. And one of the national security members of Putin's government said in an interview, the Chinese support our Russian security proposals. And this was seen um, by him and by others at the meeting and afterwards as suggesting that the two would support each other regardless of what they decided to do about their territorial desiderata. So in my opinion, what we're looking at in Ukraine is deeply bound up with the plans, the strategies, the concepts of other revisionist powers. And it's not just about what's going on in Ukraine. So what has actually happened now because of this entire background during this war? Well, first let's just have a brief statement about what the end state and strategies of these countries are. Ukraine wants the status quo. Their theory of victory is to win by not losing and they're ready to engage in a prolonged war if they can get Europeans and US engagement, and they're working very hard to get it. Russia, on the other hand, wants a Ukraine that supports Russian national interests. Their theory of victory at first was just regime change, as they had done in Kazakhstan. But they're willing to crush resistance if necessary. And so you have two different strategies. The first one they hoped would work, a quick decapitation while preventing any intervention. But if it doesn't work, they're more than willing to carry out a war of annihilation. For both, they see this as an existential conflict, which means they're willing to do anything in order to win. And how well have both sides done? Well, a lot of people have pointed out that Ukraine has done far better than anyone expected that their military effectiveness suggests that there are fewer divisions within the military 
than you might think, and that by and large, they have been willing to stand and fight. Their political diplomatic effectiveness, however, has not achieved their aims. They have, in fact, failed to get the engagement that they really wanted from Europeans and Americans. And arguments about insurgency need to be taken with a grain of salt. Insurgencies are not always successful. In fact, 75% of the time, they either fail completely or fail to achieve fully what the insurgents want. So it's not true that engaging in an insurgency is the go-to sure winner for Ukraine, especially if you're dealing with a Russia whose military effectiveness has been denigrated, but that, suggest, that assumes certain things that I don't know are true or false. I have not seen the full engagement of Russian divisions, uh, armored divisions, for instance, in this fight. Um, armor units are by and large not even put into this fight yet. They have not bombed infrastructure the way you would if you're fighting a total war. It suggests that they hoped to be able to take Ukraine whole and not destroy its infrastructure. That is, they thought it's going to become part of our country. We don't want to have to rebuild everything. And so they didn't destroy it. We might see, however, that they are capable of an awful lot of destruction once they put all of this material into the field of battle. We'll see. It's a little too early actually to tell. Their political diplomatic effectiveness, on the other hand, um, the vote in the UN was quite interesting. 35 nations abstained and five fully supported Russia. That was unexpected to have 40 nations that did not condemn this obvious aggression. A lot of people were pretty shocked by this and by some of the people who joined with Russia or at least abstained. India, for instance, refused to condemn this obvious aggression. And the arguments about counterinsurgency, that they always fail, they're incapable of destroying an insurgency, need to take into consideration that Russians do not fight counterinsurgencies the way Americans do. They tend to fight them the way Romans do. That is, try to kill off or push into exile two thirds of the population. Russians don't care how many Ukrainians die and they may push as many as possible into other countries in order to destabilize them. Here's what's actually happened, boots on the ground. This is from the Institute for the Study of War and I'm gonna show this a couple of times so you can catch what's going on. This is on day uh, about two and this is today. Let me do it again. About day two, today. It's not true that the Russians have been completely stopped. It's very slow advance, but they haven't been completely stopped as some people have suggested. Okay, very briefly, the consequences of this in the future of this war. Let's say Russia fails to achieve its end state. Russia achieves its end state, but with insurgent violence continuing the countryside. Russia achieves its end state by using nuclear weapons or other barbaric tactics, like just carpet bombing Kiev. Or Russia achieves its end state without an insurgency developing or using nuclear weapons. Those are the four potential end states. I don't think they're all equally likely, but they are four potential end states. And what I'd like to do is just briefly suggest that these end states will have very, very different outcomes depending on whether you are a status quo power or a revisionist power or a power that's just on the sideline willing to be convinced one way or the other. For status quo powers, the first outcome will suggest the system works, we don't need to do any more. If something like this occurs again, we'll do the same thing again. Uh, the second outcome 
suggests, however, that Russia will eventually lose. This is what I've heard from experts across the board in the United States and Europe. Looking at this, they think insurgencies are unbeatable. The will of the people, you know, 51% are against you, you can't do anything about it, right? Um, the third one, however, if Russia uses nuclear weapons or other barbaric tactics like carpet bombing, I, I think this might push a complete rethinking of the international system. And the fourth one, if Russia achieves its end state without either one of them, we'll have to give more effort. Whether you're um, a country that is not willing to engage in military action or one that is more is needed in order to stop this kind of aggression. And there will be a consideration of changes in strategies, but not a consideration of a change of the entire system, I don't believe. On the other hand, how will the revisionist powers react to this? Let's say like a China or an Iran or Pakistan. If there is a complete defeat, it, there'll be a delay of whatever plans they have in place, a rethinking of strategies, but it probably won't deter them if there's an insurgency that develops and Russia achieves its aims. Although they might plan to deal with insurgent violence afterward, they're not going to stop what they're doing because an insurgency develops. If there is no effective action taken against Russia when a nuclear weapon is used, I think we are going to see a greater willingness to use nuclear weapons themselves. And course, if they win, it'll be an encouragement to go ahead without either of those things to go ahead with their plans. And finally, the non-aligned powers, more willingness to support the system, the international system, if uh, Russia is cleanly defeated, more willingness to challenge the system, however, especially if Russia crushes that insurgency. And if Russia gets away with using nuclear weapons, if there isn't a perception that they have been adequately or somehow terribly harmed by it, why wouldn't you develop your own nuclear weapons? And if they achieve their goals, if they really achieve that end state that Russia wants, I think it'll encourage others to engage in aggressive action to achieve their own goals. Thank you. Thank you. Um... Uh, Professor Habeck, really thorough and um, fascinating presentation. And I love the way that you went into all the context and the history for us, uh, for those of us who are not familiar with it. Lively conversation going on in the chat, and I encourage you all to keep your conversation um, going. I'm going to uh, get to the questions in the Q&A box. We have about uh, 25 minutes for questions, and we have about 20 questions already. So uh, we'll get to as many of them as we can. Um, the first question that I want to get to is there were a few people who were raising sort of uh, points that they, they wanted to see put into the timeline. So let's go to, uh, sorry, I just lost it. Um, while, while I'm looking for it, there was some questions about the language. And if you could just comment on the similarity between the Russian language and the Ukrainian language, someone was saying, is it, is it like comparing Spanish to Portuguese? I, I think probably Spanish and Portuguese or Spanish and Italian are good examples. Um, if somebody who speaks Russian spends a lot of time listening to Ukrainian in Ukraine, uh, speaks uh, the language a little bit, after a few days, maybe a week or so, it becomes mutually intelligible uh, by and large. But there's an awful lot of false friends and there's a lot of vocabulary that the two don't share. Uh, for Russians, they, they tend to say or think that it sounds kind of archaic, the language that is sometimes used by um, the vocabulary um, used, or it's kind of this rare word. I, I've heard it before, but I don't quite remember what it's supposed to mean. Uh, but again, there's a lot of false friends as there are between like Spanish and Italian. So if, if you work at it, it, it can over time, you can basically learn the other language and it becomes mutually intelligible. But it's not 
at all, let's say, like English spoken in London versus English spoken in Glasgow, which, they- you know, it's hard for people who are raised, born, raised, say, in London or New York to understand people who are born, raised in Glasgow. But that doesn't um, prevent you after about 20 minutes, 15 minutes of listening to it. You're like, OK, I get it now. Right. It's just a different pronunciation and slightly different vocab. It's not like that at all. It's really, really helpful. Yeah, really helpful explanation. Thank you. Yeah. Um, Allison wants to know uh about the Budapest Memorandum. And a few people uh, raised that, wondered if you could comment on it. Okay, Budapest Memorandum, you guys are actually gonna have to tell me what this is. This Ah, is, there's gaps in my knowledge. All right, so we'll take it to the chat to bring that up. Um, And Allison, if you're still here, and I know there were a couple of other people who commented on it. Let's go to Deborah's question about the UN admitting Ukraine. So what and when was the vote um, in the UN about admitting admitting that Ukraine was a sovereign nation? Did Russia agree? Um, And how does that affect their their invasion at this point? Yeah, in the 1990s, there was basically no disagreement that all of these countries deserve to be admitted as sovereign nations And they were admitted basically one right after the other with no trouble at all. Russia was admitted as actually Russia was not the Soviet Union. And there have been um, discussions about whether they should be on the Security Council because uh, the charter for the UN lists the Soviet Union. And Ukrainians have said, hey, we were part of the Soviet Union, too, at that time. So does that mean we get to have your seat on the Uh, the Security Council. So there was basically no disagreement. Everybody voted for each other. And um, uh, it was seen as kind of a no brainer that we uh, that these had become separate nations and should be admitted. Uh, The places there were difficulties were places that uh, remained sections or parts of Russia in particular, although there were some other sections that also had Um, There are kind of desires for autonomy or independence on a lot of different places that weren't granted, and they were kind of quashed. So, for instance, the Chechens wanted to have um, uh, to be separate from Russia and attempted to fight for this, um, for their independence throughout the 1990s. And uh, the Russians sent in their military and absolutely flattened uh, Grozny, the capital, um, just um, basically carried out the kind of counterinsurgency that I mentioned with about two thirds of the population of Chechnya being pushed into Dagestan and other nearby places. So uh, when the Tsarnaev brothers went back to um, their family in uh, Chechnya, they didn't go to Chechnya, they went to Dagestan. Their family was in Dagestan, not Chechnya. So this was, um, there were places that were like this that tried uh, to fight for autonomy or even independence and it was squashed. But by and large, each one of them was recognized and there was, there was basically no discussion about it in 91 to, through 93. Okay, so um, Allison is coming back with a clarification on her question and Budapest Memorandum, a number of people had asked about it referring to in 1994 when Ukraine agreed to give up its nuclear weapons in exchange for NATO's promise of defense. Boy, I've had, uh, I I actually didn't know the formal name for this. I know all about this discussion, though, and I know the way experts have had this conversation because it's been all over the place today, especially. So um, the, uh, this was not a formal sort of pledge of support by the US government to come to the aid, but rather more of an understanding I've had this discussion with people that if uh, Ukraine would give up its nuclear weapons, the United States would um, guarantee its national security interests. But the term that was used was not guarantee. According to the experts that I've spoken to about this, there was no promise that was made during this meeting that the United States would show up boots on the ground to defend Ukraine If Now, having said that, I think that this is hair splitting. And 
we have kind of fallen into this um, very bad uh, way of reaching treaties and agreements that do not entail a formal process that aren't put before the American people and that are not fully discussed uh, before they're adopted by the Senate. So in my opinion, our polarization as a country have led various administrations to reach agreements that are short of a formal treaty, that are short of a formal guarantee, and that later come back and are bad for everybody concerned. I'm, I'm pushing for an end to secret treaties secretly arrived at, which is one of the things people said led to World War I. It's ongoing right now on a global basis. And it is leading to, it is going to cause the same kinds of problems if um, it's not dealt with as it did before World War I. Uh, and since you make that comparison, it gives us a moment to just address uh, you. One of the things that you suggested was that prior to your talk that people um, read Fiona Hill's really fascinating article uh, on whether or not Putin would use nuclear weapons in this conflict. Um, and in the article, uh, Fiona Hill states that we are already in World War III. And I wonder if you could just comment, because I think if you comment on that article and, and, and yeah. her argument, I think it will address many of the questions that people are posing. Yeah, ODNI actually, uh, that is the, the, the Director of National Intelligence of the United States has actually um, been talking about the same thing. They too, um, the uh, intelligence community of the United States believes that the conflict um, that might develop, we all hope won't develop, but might develop over Taiwan, between China and Taiwan, is deeply intertwined with this conflict in Ukraine. And the fear is that if nuclear weapons are used in Ukraine, it will encourage China or others to use nuclear weapons in their fights as well. And here I'm going to be really clear, okay? And I think she's pretty clear about this as well. We're talking about tactical nuclear weapons. We're not talking about strategic nuclear weapons. And the difference is immense. Strategic nuclear weapons are used to destroy the entire like homeland of the targeted country. It, they can flatten entire cities, entire industries. It's, it, it's horrific and it's what everybody was so worried about um, during the Cold War would in fact occur. Um, on the other hand, tactical nukes tend to be measured in the kilotonnage, if even, and sometimes even less than that, if you're talking about artillery shells. And they would absolutely flatten an entire army on a battlefield, but it won't cause the kind of terrible global spillover effects if they're used. Now, having said that, okay, it's not as if these are clean weapons, and it's not as if they're not going to cause fallout and all kinds of lingering environmental and so on issues if they're ever used. They're not just big bombs, but both Russia and China have been very careful to say that they won't engage in strategic nuclear weapon kind of exchanges, but they have not said they won't engage in tactical nuclear exchanges. And Russia has brought forward their artillery pieces that in fact are designed to fire those tactical nuclear shells. So there is I think she's absolutely right. I think there is a very, very good chance that they will be used. And here's another thing. How would we know if they were used? They literally, it could have already happened and it would be impossible for us to tell because they would mimic a large thermobaric bomb, for instance, or a large tonnage, big, you know, regular bomb. And unless you had sensors on the ground, you probably couldn't pick up the spike in radiation and all the other effects from it. It could actually be the case that they've been used already, and we wouldn't even know it until much, much uh, later after this. But if Russia does this and gets away with it, everybody is deeply concerned that China will do the same thing. And I think this is what she's talking about when she talks about World War III. 
Okay, uh, I think that's a good segue into Robert's question. Um, is, is nuclear proliferation amongst a number of the revisionist and non-aligned powers a likely uh, consequence of Ukraine's vulnerability, yeah. particularly in light of the fact that, as you said, you know, that Budapest memorandum was sort of a, a closeted uh, assurance, not quite an actual guarantee, and it feels that now the powers that be have backpedaled on it. So does, yeah. that, does that mean that more groups start trying to amass nuclear weapons um, yeah. in the wake of this? I, I'm very, very concerned about this. And I actually put this as part of one of the potential follow-on effects from this. And it could be that people would be encouraged, even if Russia doesn't use them, to think the only way I could be safe is not to trust the UN to not trust the EU, to not trust NATO or the United States or any other guarantors of the current international system. The only way I can be safe is if I develop the bomb. I think it absolutely will encourage countries like Japan that could develop it anytime they wanted to go ahead and do it. Absolutely. Um, okay. Uh, I want to go to a couple of questions that have come in about the motivations, because you spoke a lot about um, sort of Russia's philosophical motivations, about Putin's specific attachment to the former Soviet Union as a, you know, as a structure in the geographic region. And people are asking questions about um, motivations that have more to do with commodities and climate change. So. Um, there's a question about agricultural productivity, you know, that Ukraine is sort of the breadbasket of that part of the world. And with climate change happening, perhaps Russia sees it as, uh, as a valuable uh, way to protect its viability in terms of food security. Um, there's another question of, uh, do you think that perhaps Russia has a desire to develop Ukraine and Crimea's potential oil and gas assets. So just wonder if you could speak to the, the role of commodities in this. Yeah, I, I look, this is also a massive discussion that's going on amongst experts about um, what's the real motivation, because there's, um, there's actually a quite a large split within the national security expert community uh, between those who believe that ideology or just this kind of patriotism or attachment to country explains people's behavior, or if you can only explain people's behavior by looking at what they consider to be real national security interest, right? So I would kind of place this in that line of discussion. Um, I don't have to see a sort of what I believe to be a real national security interest in order to explain why people go to war. Um, if we go down that road, 99.9% um, .9 of wars are in fact not worth it. They lead to far more loss, economic loss, and to economic um, sort of a little economic gain than they do to any kind of huge sort of like, hey, you know, like you get to loot it like you're the Roman Empire or something like that. Um, let me give you an exception to that so I can make the argument. Um, why did Iraq go into Kuwait and threaten Saudi Arabia? There's only one reason, right? It was all about oil. And, um, you know, he didn't want that piece of the desert or something like that. He wanted what was under the desert. And um, that's why he did it. But, um, why did he go to war with Iran? I mean, that, it, that really doesn't have as much to do with that. They, you know, you could make an argument over that island, sure, but then to fight for eight years in a way that absolutely impoverished both countries, it doesn't make sense. And the same thing is, by the way, true of a lot of wars. Economically, most wars are dead losses. You don't get anything economically or, or sort of money advantage or commodity advantage out of the vast majority of wars. So you have to go looking uh, for other explanations. In the same way, while it's true Ukraine has, you know, some of the richest 
farmland um, across the entire world. It would actually be more in Russia's interest to just engage with the market than it would be to invade and take over this place. And by the way, you know, run your everything across it and set off nuclear weapons that poison it in perpetuity, right? Um, it just economically, again, doesn't quite make sense. Well, and let's think about uh, something that's coming up for a lot of people, which is uh, your sort of various scenarios on how this ends. And the scenario where this ends with a loss for Russia or a draw, is there a way out that, uh, for lack of a better way to phrase this, allows Putin to save face? So people are referring to his extraordinary uh, inability to back down. And, and whether that um, becomes a factor in how this could yeah. end. And then on the other side, people have the question of, is it realistic to think that Ukraine could prevail in this without intervention on its behalf or alongside of it by NATO powers? Yeah. So the longer this goes on, the longer it kind of, as people are saying, drags on. Okay, so I'd just like to stop for a second. It's been two weeks, and the entire first week, most people agree, Russia was not doing much of anything except for bombing a few places, taking over a few key areas, kind of what they did in Kazakhstan. They really weren't putting an army into the field. In fact, this last week, they haven't really put much effort into uh, the three or four axes of advance that uh, the Institute for the Study of War has identified. Um, they, in fact, say, uh, this is the Institute for the Study of War, that the main attack by the Russians is likely to occur within the next 24 to 96 hours. And that's why I'm very reluctant to conclude things about the military effectiveness of either Russia or Ukraine until we see Russia actually putting its main forces in the, on the ground and attempting to take territory in a serious way. So two weeks, right? But uh, it took the United States three weeks to conquer Iraq. So, and that was with us, you know, really trying. I mean, we put, you know, everything we had, pedal to the metal, heading for Baghdad and, and out to Anbar and all the other places, you know, and it still took three weeks. So after we see this main effort, whether it's, you know, 24 to 96 hours as ISW thinks, or it starts a little bit later than that, then we'll kind of be able to say what's really going on with military effectiveness. Okay. Uh I want to say to everyone in the audience, a lot of great questions coming in. There are 55 questions outstanding now, so I definitely won't get to all of them. And um, before we approach the last few minutes of our conversation, uh, I just want to give a shout out to Yale Alumni College, which was a co-sponsor of this presentation and is hosting the course with Professor Habeck that some very lucky people will be taking this spring online. If you're interested in Yale Alumni College programs, please go to the Yale Alumni Association website and click on the Learn tab. You will find out that there are amazing courses taught by brilliant professors like Mary Haybeck um, available to you to take uh, online throughout the year. And I see you, um, Professor Habeck, just itching to say something. So I'll pass it over to you. I'm, I'm, I'm totally like free forming here, but free flowing here. But if you want to go over the time a bit, everybody who's ever taken a class with me knows I'm totally cool with going over the time. And especially if there's, I see now 57 questions. <laughs> just keep piling on. <laughs> so, you know, if we took another 15 minutes, I'm totally okay with that. I, I'm happy to do that. And, and this session is being recorded. So, oh. um, it, you know, if you have to leave, you can um, feel comfortable that you can come back and watch the recording. And everyone who registered for the session will receive an email with, uh, with a link to the recording as soon as it's available. Um, okay, because a lot of, I mean, a lot of us are watching the news, right? And we're seeing all the pundits mm -hmm. and their different comments. And, and rarely do we get an expert like you 
where we have this sort of uninterrupted time to just ask you anything. Um, so these are burning questions that many people have. Um, I, I want to go to uh, the a, a theme in the comments has been economic sanctions and whether or not, I think one of the most interesting questions was whether or not the economic sanctions that the West has mm -hmm. put on Russia could be counterbalanced by those countries that voted with Russia, those countries that you um, that you mentioned, you know, being sort of allied with them in this in this situation, would they be able to sort of undermine the U.S.'s sanctions on Russia by counter sanctioning the West? Yeah, I don't know about that. A counter sanction, you know, there's what uh, forty nations, and many of them are very poor nations. I don't think that's. Um, well, a, certainly, we're problem. very dependent on China. So yeah, um, China is a different thing. conversation about. Yeah. China's, China's, but that's a question that has come up too. Yeah, so. and I'm, I'm happy to address that separately from these other nations, though, that might decide to do a counter sort of thing. I, I'm far more um, concerned about the fact that, let's say, India, which is a massive consumer of oil or uh, natural gas, would be willing to break a sanction in order to get you know, cheap oil or gas from a Russia that's desperate. I, I absolutely think that that's a possibility or Pakistan would be willing to do that or maybe even China. Um, and I'm not sure how we would enforce sanctions, economic sanctions then on someplace like China or India. What would we do? Everything we would do to punish China or India would actually harm us just as much. It's, this is the problem I think in, in fact, sanctions as a whole have a kind of, uh, well, the social science on it is, let's just say unsettled, that it actually makes a difference. And it's basically what we can do, but maybe not what should be done. And I think we've reached the point in our evolution as a global community where we are so interdependent on each other that many people did not think something like this would even be possible, you know, that we could be having this conversation in 2022. Yeah. Um, uh, and it raises another, another question that I, I thought was very interesting that was posed is with the U.S. going to Venezuela and going to some of these countries that, you know, we would have if five months ago had nothing to do with to talk about oil, you know, given that they are in that block of, of sort of Russian allied or semi-allied that you identified, are we not empowering them more by seeking to make deals with, with countries like Venezuela? Yeah, I'm very worried about it. And um, I, I see all kinds of arguments on both sides about allowing more um, drilling, more fracking in the United States, that this is, you know, the solution to this problem, um, the decision over the pipeline. I've heard people arguing about that. And um, every once in a while, you have like these questions, you know, at the White House uh, that raise these same issues. I personally am not the expert, and I cannot tell you if this would actually solve the problem. However, um, Russia controls 20, 21% of the world's supply of oil. And when you control that much, you can actually act as OPEC. And harming them could harm us just as much. If they withdraw this from you know, the world markets, it will create um, a massive problem for every single economy in the world. And I'm not confident that the loss of income will lead to the immediate collapse of Putin's government. I'm not confident that that in fact will occur. I don't think we know what kind of support he has. There are a lot of people who've been hoping that there will be some kind of popular uprising in Russia, that the KGB, well, the FSB, is, they're still the same guys, um, will you know, take care of him or things like this. And I, I don't know. It's, it's like one of those imponderables, but we can't count on something like that occurring. 
But so it's interesting, um, someone has posed, and I've heard this question brought up frequently, that, that Putin's, um, whether Putin really has full support of his own government um, yeah. in this endeavor and whether we could, uh, could we expect that there might be um, sort of internal conflict that might cause, you know, cause him to lose his power from within? Yeah, I don't, I don't have any feel for it all. And the elections that have been held by him or by Medvedev, who is basically him, um, when he was apparently on vacation for a few years, all of those elections are suspect. It's completely impossible for us as outsiders to be able to tell what's really going on. And, um, but again, we can't count on this to actually create these, the conditions we hope for. We, it's, it's basically, a, a strategy of hope if we do that, right? And, and pretty much predicated on wishful thinking. Unless we have hard data, then we can perhaps work to, you know, encourage that and lead to some kind of better outcome uh, for everybody concerned. But I, I don't think, I, I haven't seen anything that's trustworthy that says we know what's really going on internally in this very, uh, secretive country. Still, well, and I, I've seen it raised quite frequently that this is as much of a war of information as yeah. it is a war of of, of weaponry. Um, yeah. And to that end, you know, engaging in the information war is something that you know Ukraine has been quite lauded in in how they have dealt with it, and mm -hmm. certainly it um, prevented just what what I think Russia may have expected which was that they would sort of walk in level ukraine very quickly and it, and this would be all wrapped up in a matter of days yeah. um as this does continue on past the very long two-week point uh, you know the way that you identified it um people want to know you know what should the u.s do okay we've done sanctions what else should and i know you can't answer that question i've actually avoided asking it but it's yeah. Now there's so many people asking that question in so many different ways that. <laughs> yeah, I, uh, no, this is, this is the question of the hour, right? So to me, this is one of those situations when the, the best answer, the, you know, what would be closest to the, you know, get us at um, the right answer was something that should have been done a year ago. A year ago, if we had had, um, you know, if you knew that there was going to be this invasion, if you're watching this buildup in April of 2021, that's when this buildup actually of forces on the border with Ukraine actually occurred, April of 2021. And if then you had had a decision to, let's say, invite Ukraine into NATO and put 10,000 boots, NATO boots in Kiev, I think we would probably have had a quite different outcome. Now we might have ended up in a war faster, but everything we have seen from Putin suggests that he is actually, while he takes risks none of us would ever take, he actually is a little tentative and he sends out a lot of feelers before he actually um, does anything. In this case, we had from April all the way to February, quite a long time to change his mind about, about doing something. And I'm not sure he would have taken this kind of risk if there had been some sort of really kind of firm movement by the United States in April of 2021. The problem is, and I watched this super carefully, I was very concerned. April of 2021, I put out my, <laughs> final exam at American University and for my class on American military history, in which the final exam was one question that said, um, Russia invades Ukraine with um, you know, like 100,000 troops and a week later, China invades Taiwan with uh, 2 million troops, okay? You're called to the White House and you have to design a grand strategy for dealing with this conflict, okay? To me, I, I thought this is, it's going to happen. I didn't have, you know, any doubts that this was going to be 
uh, the outcome if something wasn't done to change the minds of these two um, particular leaders. And in my opinion, the only thing that would change their minds, this isn't true of everybody everywhere, but these two particular people, and uh, you know, there's a couple others one can point to as well, is either you use force or the threat of force to stop them. Otherwise, they'll do it. So I'm, it, unless we're able to change Xi's mind about Taiwan, he is going to invade Taiwan. And it's just a matter of when and the timing. And this, what is happening right now in Ukraine is our last chance perhaps to change his mind about what we'll do. And sanctions are not gonna do it. Economic sanctions are not going to do it. We have to do something more forceful, even if there's a risk, and there is a risk that Putin will respond by using nuclear weapons on the battlefield. Well, I think he has said as much um, on more than, than one occasion. Yes, um, he has. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it, it brought me to another question which is um, whether the, whether, what's NATO's role in this? In other words, is yeah. allowing a sort of a NATO creep eastward a bigger factor than perhaps we think of in, and, and you know, we know that the Ukraine wanting to enter um, NATO and, and, and so forth, you know, as you described it, wanting to become more European um, is one of the variables that, uh, that triggered this event. But to what extent is NATO itself and its sort of blindness to the reaction that might be provoked uh, mm. another trigger? Yeah, a, a lot. Of, this is actually, there's a, a massive amount of literature and discussion about this specific point. And there's um, two uh, viewpoints that are generally taken by people. Um, one is that absolutely, all you have to do is look at the rhetoric coming from Russia, this is before Putin, um, and what happened over um, the Balkans to see that the uh, NATO enlargement made uh, Russia less willing to cooperate with the international community, less willing to cooperate with um, others um, in Europe, and more aggressive. Um, and a lot of people have pointed this out. Um, but at the same time, others have said the, uh, there was an outreach, whether it was serious or not. And again, we have people who argue both sides of this by the United States to Russia saying, if you want to join NATO as well, we're not closing the door to you eventually joining NATO. And there was a decision made by Russia and by the United States to close that door. In my opinion, that's more of an explanation for why we've ended up here. If that door had been left open, if there had been ongoing discussions throughout the 1990s about having all of us in the same place, um, it would have been less threatening uh, to any Russian leader. Um, but there's, uh, there's another point I was gonna make about this issue as well. Um, It'll come to me, NATO enlargement. I'm gonna, <laughs> I'm gonna, I'm gonna go to Afghanistan. Uh, there was a, a question raised that uh, if the U.S. withdrawal from Afghanistan and the way that many of many people saw that, you know, both at home and abroad, as a, a really a bungled event, did that? You talked about the U.S. needing to use more force earlier on, and perhaps that would have dissuaded Russia. Um, and so people are wondering if the way that the withdrawal from Afghanistan was handled emboldened Russia to feel more confident in this yeah. move. It's my contention, and I know there are a lot of experts out there who disagree with me, that absolutely this is one of the factors that encouraged Putin to take more risk than he usually would. This is my read on the guy. He obviously takes risks that our country doesn't take. And he does aggressive things our country would never do. But again, he is kind of tentative and he tends to send out feelers 
And then if they get kind of pushed back, he backs off for at least a while and then he'll try again. So in my opinion, this was one of the things that encouraged him to take this very risky um, chance and uh, invade Ukraine. Um, again, I've had discussions with a lot of people who don't think it's true, but the quotations that I gave you are just one of a variety of them from these bad actors who have um, all said the same kinds of things that the Communist Party said in their uh, English language propaganda organ. Okay, so this is, you know, um, their um, basically their way of messaging to the United States. And it says that, you know, what I quoted there is a direct quote from them. You can read the whole thing. It's about how Afghanistan shows how weak the United States is. They aren't willing to come to the aid of their um, allies and Taiwan specifically when the war starts, not if, when the war starts, you can't count on the U.S. to come to your aid. So this to me, it's not just Russia, it's China, it's these other bad actors. And they held that meeting then. And it's immediately after that, that Russia begins a massive buildup from this 80,000 to 190,000 over time, and begins using very aggressive language towards Ukraine and demanding all sorts of impossible things um, from Zelensky and the country. Really interesting. Uh, in the in the couple of minutes that we have left, um, I think we've hit on most of the major um, the major questions. The only thing that we haven't touched on is a number of questions um, wondering if you know the U.S. has has um, equipment that would be able to detect you know whether it's satellite equipment or otherwise detect whether or not. Uh, Russia had used some kind of nuclear force in Ukraine. And if, if, if we did, assuming that we did, and again, you can't answer this, but I think it's a, a useful thought exercise. Um, what would the U.S. do? So let's yeah, assume yeah, that, just, that oh, nuclear yeah. weapons were used. What would the U.S. do? I mean, this is actually the problem, right? Because the United States uh, my understanding, we have no tactical nukes. So you can't have uh, deterrence of the usual sort. If you use it, we'll proportionately answer. That's, that's just not even in the cards. All we have are, as far as I know, strategic nukes that have not been tested in any way since the 1980s and, uh, or updated. So it could be you try to set one of them off and it's like a big old fizzle or something. And I, we don't have a nuclear deterrence in my opinion any longer, nor do we have a publicly expressed uh, nuclear deterrent policy, which is the only way that nuclear deterrence works. You have to have a publicly stated policy that's out there for the entire world. You can't have a secret policy of deterrence. It doesn't deter if it's secret. And as far as I know, the United States does not even have a deterrent policy. So the first thing I would do because of this threat is develop a publicly stated nuclear deterrent policy of what we would do if Russia were to use tactical nukes on a battlefield. This will be our response. All right. Well, uh, really insightful, very insightful commentary. I think we've covered all the major points um, that have been raised and uh, so many people appreciated you going back, you know, taking us back to the 1200s and giving us that context. Obviously, this is something that has been in the making for a long time and, um, and it's not, it's the latest iteration of an ongoing um, challenge around around borders, um, as many wars are. So I, I guess I would just give you the last words to close with. I, I think many people will leave this saying, well, what can I do? Um, yeah. And so I'll just cede the floor to you for any closing thoughts, Professor Habeck. So um, you could tell that I've been kind of uh, steeped in history, but I tend to think about history as um, what is relevant to the people who are involved. And for both Russia 
and Ukraine. What's relevant for them is that history that starts with Kiev and uh, Rus and that goes through the Mongol invasion right up until today. We tend to think that what's important for us is just the last election or 15 years ago. That's far enough of, you know, away for us, right, as Americans. But for the rest of the world, history has a depth and a meaning that I think it's worth your while to explore in order to understand what they think about this uh, conflict. All right. Well, I hope that we can have you back for another talk sometime in the future. This has been wonderful. Thank you for the extra time. Thank you to all of you for attending. And we will see you on the next presentation. Great.